All righty, welcome everybody. We are now in week two of the 2022 collage. Um, uh oh, I'm hearing some echo. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, so far we've uh, the only thing I've that we've been sort of doing offline has been the uh, Slack discussions, and uh, there's been some good, a lot of good back and forth there. If you haven't taken a look yet at the Slack, please, uh, please. Give it a look if you can. If, if you don't have the invitation, let me know and I can send that to you. Um, yeah, so we had our reading about the, uh, you know, the uh, the first chapter of Ashwanden's book and there was some good discussion of that. I don't know if there's anything that rises to the occasion of, of bringing up right now. Um, yeah, I think everybody sort of agreed. It was a good sort of broad overview of, of the corona and, and solar wind and a little bit of space weather. Uh, hopefully we'll have some more introductions to those things in, in written form as we go forward. Um, so yeah, so now I would actually like to start to dive into the physics of the corona. Why is it so hot? Um, and really what's, what's, whoops, what's going on with, uh, yeah, coronal heating, you know, why is it still a problem? Um, so we'll start by talking about sort of the energy budget of the corona, right? Where does the energy for the heating come from? How does it get from the surface of the sun up to the corona? And then what actually produces the, uh, the heat? Apologies for the awkward alliteration in 1C there. Um, but yeah, once we sort of go over those processes, uh, so this is week two. Week three, we'll, we'll continue talking about number two, which is basically, if you know the heating rate, how do you compute the state of the plasma, right? How do you know how hot it is, how dense it is, how high the pressure is? Um, and we'll talk about a lot of those nuts and bolts, both later today and next week, when we also bring up a, uh, a Jupyter notebook where we can work with some of these things in real time. Um, but then in weeks three and four, I wanna go back to the actual coronal heating processes. So in week three, we'll talk about processes involving waves and turbulence, and in week four, we'll talk about magnetic reconnection and nanoflares. And I'll introduce them today, but we'll we'll talk about them in more detail in a few weeks. So yeah, so there's that. And then there's this uh, details of how you actually determine the state of the, uh, the plasma. And we'll see how much of that we get through today. And yeah, continue it next week. The, uh, the actual, oops, the actual energy availability I think goes all the way back to the convection zone of the sun. Um, I don't know if it's unanimously understood by solar physicists, the, 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 this first bullet that I'm giving here, but it's certainly the vast majority of them, I think agree that if you wanna know where the energy for the chromospheric and coronal heating comes from, it's gotta be coming from lower down, you know, below the surface of the sun, and the thing that dominates just below the surface is this convection zone. Um, you know the basic story, I'm sure, that the energy is generated in the core, flows up through most of the sun in the form of photons, and then in this outermost 30% of the sun, the, uh, the, uh, the opacity of the gas gets to be too high, so the photons get absorbed, but the energy still has to make it out, so it gets transferred into kinetic energy, right? These chaotic bubbles and blobs get formed. The hot blobs rise up through the convection zone, the cool blobs fall. And both of those things, hot things rising and cool things falling, both tend to give you an outward or upward transport of, of thermal energy. And throughout the convection zone, these convective eddies carry pretty much the whole, the, the entire energy flux that's generated in the core of the sun. So you can compute that uh, if, if you want to extend it all the way up to the surface. You can you can estimate what that would be in terms of the solar luminosity divided by the surface area of the sun at the surface. That's also known as the you know, the, the the solar flux at the surface, and it's also written in terms of this uh, Stefan Boltzmann constant times the effective temperature to the fourth. This is the actual uh, equation that defines what we mean by effective temperature. It's really not the temperature measured at some point. It's essentially just this quantity that, that you can compute from the flux. And 
I've chosen these, these sort of SI units, even though most of what I'm going to be doing in this course is Gaussian CGS units. Uh, this is a very convenient unit for, for flux, because what we'll see eventually is that the numbers we care about for the corona are going to be of order one. Uh, but it is interesting that through the convection zone and essentially going up to the surface, um, there's this rather large number, 63,000 kilowatts per meter squared being transported up. Um, then I'll, if the if the entire outward 30% of the sun was convectively unstable, then we would see the convective eddies carrying that energy at the top, but we don't. Uh, the, when we're actually looking at the photosphere, the photosphere is a convectively stable sort of thin shell sitting on top of the unstable convection zone. So at the photosphere, all that 63,000 kilowatts per meter squared have been converted back into photons and it's photons carrying that out. Um, but, but that conversion has, isn't exactly 100% efficient. You know, sitting above the top of the convection zone is often a layer that astronomers call the overshoot layer. You know, when we're looking down at the sun and looking at these uh, granules that look like the top of a pot of boiling water, we're, 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 we're still seeing some of the remnants of that upper edge of the convectively unstable region. It's not totally hidden way down below the surface. So we're still seeing a remnant of this energy uh, that is still carried in the form of upflows and downflows in terms of kinetic energy flux. Um, I don't know of a good theory that predicts that at the photosphere, but we can use observations to estimate what that must be. So for example, the, the, the in fluid dynamics, the kinetic energy flux is something like one half times the density times the, 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 the average flow speed cubed. Um, and we can measure densities and flow speeds, say in the granulation at the surface. And we get numbers like 500 kilowatts per meter squared. So very much you know, reduced from the, the bulk of the convection zone, whoops. Um, but it is still a substantial amount of kinetic energy that's churning right at the surface of the photosphere. Um, again, this is just an order of magnitude estimate. And as I say at the bottom, this doesn't distinguish between up and down flows or horizontal motions. It's really just a, a, a representative number. But it's a good representative number um, because it tells us really what we have to work with at the surface of the sun. Um, well, then we have to think about how the surface of the sun extends up into the corona. And you, we last week, we looked at a lot of pictures of magnetic fields. And in chapter one of Ashwanden, you looked at a lot of pictures of magnetic fields extending up from the surface. Um, and we realized that the if you look at the entire sort of volume of the corona and you map down the magnetic fields into the photosphere, that really only maps down into a small fraction of the total surface area of the sun. Um, the other way to say that is that if you're going up from the sun and you're following the magnetic field, in many, many of those locations, if you follow the field, you're just on a very, very short loop and you go right back down again, even before you reach the corona. So we have to take that into account too when we're following the energy flux all the way up. And apologies, I, I forget where it was in the Slack that we talked about these confusing uh, 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 diagrams. Here, well, well, we'll we'll get one in a second, but I do want to talk about the physics of what we're talking about here, right? If we're if we're following these magnetic fields into regions where the bundles of the magnetic field expand up as you go up into the corona, um, we have to sort of take a clue from Maxwell's most boring equation, right? The uh, the uh, divergence of the magnetic field is equal to zero. The the it's the no monopoles uh, equation. But in space physics and solar physics, it's often called the conservation of magnetic flux. Because if you, if you take a bundle of magnetic field lines and you follow them, the cross-sectional area is going to go inversely proportional to the actual magnetic field strength uh, through those, through, through, through that region, right? You can see that as the as the area goes up, the field strength goes, goes down. And yeah, that's what's happening on the surface of the sun. Again, apologies for these confusogram type pictures, but yeah, there's a lot going on. But again, if you're looking up at the corona, the magnetic field lines have expanded out to fill a lot of the volume. And if you map them down, 
it's mapping to a much smaller part of the uh, of the solar surface. And again, you have to take these these diagrams with a grain of salt. They're 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 telling you the things that the authors want to convey, uh, and sometimes they can be different. But in general, this is the type of thing that's happening. I can also show you one of my own um, that maybe is a little more easier to follow, uh, but it shows sort of several levels of expansion of the magnetic flux tubes as you go from the photosphere on out, right? If you're really looking in detail at the granulation at the surface, a lot of the magnetic field outside of the umbers of sunspots, uh, but pretty much everywhere else on the sun, most of that magnetic field is concentrated into little tiny bright points that they're called in the lanes between the granules. So the actual size of these little bright points that you can see from dekist images on the left are really only about 50 to 100 kilometers, right? One granule is about a thousand kilometers. Um, so these represent the, the, in the, in the first little cartoon image there, they represent these little thin magnetic flux tubes that get shaken back and forth by the granulation. But then as you go up, they expand out, the field weakens, um, and it sort of fills the space above it. If you zoom out to the super granules in the middle panel of the cartoons, there's another, that that's what was sort of shown in the previous cartoon. There's this, this additional sort of expanding out and there's these sort of canopy regions in the centers of the super granule cells, but then it's the lanes, the super granular network, whoops, that uh, expands up and, and the field weakens above that. Then there's even larger scale uh, changes in the global magnetic field, which we'll talk about in maybe four or five weeks when we start to talk about this, how the solar wind is connected to all this. Um, but the, the basic upshot of all this is that the field strength decreases, right? In the bright points, it's a few thousand gauss. In the active regions, it's a few hundred. In quiet sun and coronal hole regions, uh, I hope these acronyms are clear, it's only a few tens of gauss. So the filling factor, mapping up all the way down to a smaller part of the sun, can be something like 10% to 1%, depending on the uh, magnetic activity. Of the, of the region. And that means that that 500 kilowatts per square meter gets reduced by either a factor of 10 to a factor of 100. So what's available per unit area up in the corona is, is much less, you know, basically by this, by this factor. Um, yeah, so this is sort of what we have available in, in the corona from the solar convection zone. So we've gone all the way from 63,000 to five to, to, to 50. But we wanna compare, what do we need, right? Is this enough to heat the corona? And the answer to that question, I think is yes. Um, what I can show you here is a table from a very old uh, review paper. And I actually just realized that I have the, uh, the uh, book where that was published in the annual reviews of astronomy and astrophysics. In my, off, in, in my office, and I actually opened it up. It's been ages since I opened it up, and I realized that that I forget where I got this book from. But right, uh, that there was there was a bookmark in here, and somebody had a, a desk calendar from 1978 used being used as a bookmark right in the Withrow and Noise article. So people have been looking at this article for a long time. Um, I've actually taken this table and massaged the numbers a little bit to put them into these kilowatts per square meter uh, units. I think with bro and noise used Gaussian, um, but I like these units better. But yeah, focus on the orange and the yellow bars there because this tells us that there is enough. Um, that the fact that these numbers are of the same order of magnitude or a little less, these are called losses, uh, energy losses due to radiation and heat conduction and other things. But for any loss, if you want to maintain a steady state, you need a gain to balance it out. You need, you know, these are basically uh, cooling uh, that, that where the, the corona is losing energy, and they've been uh, estimated observationally. But to balance that and to keep maintain the corona in its, in its steady state, you'd need exactly those amounts in the orange and yellow bars to, uh, to, to be input into the corona as heat. To, uh, to maintain the steady state. But yeah, it seems to work out. Um, 
order of magnitude of the energy. So yeah, there's a question about the order of magnitude of the energy in the magnetic field. Well, energy density is a slightly different thing than these energy fluxes we're talking about here. I'll talk about energy density in the in the EM fields very soon. But yeah, yeah, we'll 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 come back to that a little bit. Um, yeah, so okay, thumbs up because there there does seem to be the right amount available. But that's really only step one, right? Having the energy there in the corona is only is only one part of it. And we haven't really talked about how the energy gets from the photosphere to the corona. We've just talked about how much would be there if if everything sort of survived from that from that photospheric part of the convection. But now we have to think about how it gets there. How is it transported up? And to do that, we now have to go back to things like uh, energy conservation equations. And the place to start, I think, is the electromagnetic energy conservation equation. You've probably seen this in an e &M type course. I think this is also called Poynting's theorem, uh, but it's really just energy conservation for the electric and magnetic fields derived just from Maxwell's equations. You know, the capital U's are the energy densities that are present in some little parcel of of the uh, of the the solar atmosphere, the uh, divergence of S or the pointing flux tells you how that energy is being transported through through the walls of that parcel, essentially in, into or out of the parcel because it's a divergence. Um, and then on the right hand side, there is this uh, joule heating or uh, current dissipation term that comes if you have an electric current. Um, this is where the, the electric and magnetic field couples to the rest of the universe, because if there's a loss, if there's a negative term on the right-hand side, it means there's a loss of electromagnetic energy, and then you have to ask, where does it go? You know, total energy is always conserved, so if it's leaving the electric and magnetic field, it's going somewhere else, and the clue, of course, is that I've called it heating. Uh, it goes to the particles, the, uh, the particles that carry those electric currents uh, gain in energy due to this loss here. We'll talk about that a bit later, but it's really the the the, the left hand side that I wanted to talk about, right? If if there's a change in the energy inside the parcel, uh, the it's this pointing flux term that tells us how the you know that 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 change only happens when there's energy leaving the parcel or entering. All right. Now this is true for electric and magnetic fields. We want to talk about plasma. We want to talk about the corona and the, and the chromosphere. Um, we have to then go to the realm of magnetohydrodynamics. But a lot of what I just said above still holds because this pointing flux is still a useful concept. It still tells us about how energy is being transported by the magnetic field. And in a plasma, the magnetic field threads the whole thing. And we, we, we also know that the corona um, is very dominated by its magnetic energy. The corona is a low beta plasma. Um, so yeah, so we can we can evaluate this pointing flux. And in an ideal MHD uh, plasma, the electric field is basically given by the flow velocity of the of the fluid crossed into the magnetic field. Uh, it's this ideal, uh, you know, sort of frame dragging, you know, frozen in flux idea. If you haven't gone through that derivation, I should probably think of posting uh, uh, links to my YouTube videos from my 2020 uh, radiative dynamical processes class where I went through those derivations. So if, if I don't, if you don't see those, remind me and I can, I can post those. Um, so yeah, you can evaluate the pointing flux for an MHD fluid, and it really just depends on the flow velocity of the fluid and the strength of the magnetic field. That's nice. That's a nice expression down at the lower right. It's unfortunately opaque for humans to, to try to think about what it means because it's two different vector cross products nested within one another. I, I can't think of that very intuitively. So whenever I see something like this, the first thing I wanna do is to break it up into its components um, so if we have sort of a Cartesian geometry where the sun's surface is a flat plane, what we want to know is the vertical component. We want to know the energy flux that's transported upwards so we can work out that component. So I've got these X and Z components on the right-hand side. Um, don't take the X too literally. It could be something anywhere in the X or Y plane, you know, the U dot B vector thing. They don't have to be uh, 
parallel or anti-parallel. They can be sort of anything in the in the x y plane. But yeah, I think this is a more helpful way of looking at the pointing flux because these two different components tell us a lot about sort of representative situations in the corona. So that first term tells us that if you have vertical velocity, u sub z, and you have horizontal magnetic field, then that represents energy being transported up. And the example in the sun is going to be something with a horizontal magnetic field, like the top of a of a little bipolar magnetic field region. And if that's emerging through the surface and it's coming up, that's transporting pointing flux up into the corona. That's one, one sort of simple example. The other term, well, it's a little more complicated. You have to have a, a non-zero BZ and a non-zero horizontal field and a non-zero uh, uh, velocity. And the sort of basic example of that is going to be something like alphane waves or magnetohydrodynamic waves in a magnetic field. Right? If you have a vertical or an oblique magnetic field and you at the bottom, you basically pluck the magnetic field like a guitar string. Those transverse oscillations will propagate up the magnetic field. They will, you know, they will represent non-zero, you know, horizontal velocities, and they'll also perturb the field so that there's a bx component as well. And that will also propagate energy up the magnetic field. Have a non-zero s sub z component. Um, it's still a topic of research whether the first component or the second component are more important on the sun. Um, as I say at the bottom, both of them probably contribute in different ways in different parts of the sun, but it's, it's useful to be thinking about them both. Um, but I do want to now step back just a little bit from all this vector stuff. And let's just think again about order of magnitude numbers, right? Does this pointing flux evaluated this way give us the right order of magnitude? for to sort of match the amount of energy that, we, that we're pretty sure we know has to be there uh, from the previous uh, set of calculations, right? We can plug in some numbers here too. So you can write the order of magnitude just as one factor of u, two factors of b, and the four pi in, in Gaussian units. Another way to write this would be in terms of the alphane speed. And I kind of like that just because it reminds us that this, yes, this is an energy flux. Remember our kinetic energy flux from a few slides ago was just rho u cubed. And this is just another rho times, you know, a velocity cubed type quantity. Um, but we can plug in the numbers and for, you know, a kilometer per second for the, for the photospheric shaking velocities from the granulation and typical magnetic fields, we get numbers again of that same sort of ballpark that we were thinking about before. It's a little bit larger than it's needed, but again, that's sort of a good thing because this pointing flux tells you how much energy is being transported up, not just into the corona, but through the corona, right? This, some of this energy, like say in the form of waves, can just, can just keep on going. And if all of it keeps on going, then it's really kind of useless to us, right? We want some of that energy to be converted from the magnetic field into the particles, right? Maybe hopefully into some sort of random kinetic energy or thermal energy of the particles to produce the coronal heating. Um, so yeah, so this is sort of giving us the ballpark energy, you know, ballpark uh, energy flux that's that's going up through that region. But then we have to figure out the, how how a fraction of that gets converted as it goes. And for that, uh, uh, the, the, the type of thing that I think we want to compute is a heating rate, sometimes called a volumetric heating rate, power per unit volume, because that's the units of all the terms in those energy conservation equations that I was showing before, right? Energy density per unit time. You know, how much is the energy density in a parcel increasing over time due to this heating. And if you go back to the, the electromagnetic version, that's going to be proportional to the divergence of the pointing flux, but we can multiply it by some dimensionless efficiency factor that's hopefully less than one to, to figure out how much of that is getting converted uh, from magnetic energy to particle energy. And then again, keeping with our 
order of magnitude way of thinking, we can take that pointing flux and treat this divergence as just a spatial derivative. So we just take the pointing flux and divide it by a length, a typical length scale over which that dissipation is, is happening. That, that capital L I'm gonna to continue to use later on as the typical length of a coronal loop, right? That's connected on both sides to the sun. Um, yeah, that's sort of the typical length scale that we care about for, for dissipating things as they propagate along the corona. But yeah, this is sort of giving us a way of, of expressing the total heating rate in terms of, of sort of comprehensible ingredients. And the reason that I think this is a useful thing to do is that a couple of years ago, Amy Weinbarger and I wrote a review paper uh, for the same for the same annual reviews uh, book, um, where we we sort of summarized the process, the uh, progress of coronal heating, and tried to uh, uh, collect together all the different proposed ideas. I'll show you a table from that in a second. Um, but we realized that this that this way of expressing it was pretty useful because all those different physical processes that were suggested for coronal heating, many of them could be expressed in a by basically scaling out this pointing flux divided by the length, and then everything else that was left over, sort of the unique features of that process. And we realized that pretty much all of them could be expressed by just different combinations of length and time scales of the, of the corona. Uh, question is partial U of partial T equal to Q heat. Yes, yes. I didn't want to say that explicitly because it's really, Q heat is really defined as the partial time derivative of capital U thermal, right? It's the thermal energy of the particles. Though, though the other capital U's I was using earlier were for the electromagnetic, electromagnetic energy density. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll come to that. I'll come to that soon. Yeah, so yeah, different processes are, represented by different combinations of length and time scales. Let me define what some of these are, right? This capital L is the length of the loop, as I said. This lambda photosphere is sort of the typical horizontal scale of the photospheric, you know, either shaking motions or the size of that bipole as it comes up, depending on how we're thinking of the, the, the pointing flux. That's gonna be of order, you know, 100 to 1,000 kilometers, right? The size of a granule. The taus are time scales, and the tau sub a is the time scale for magnetic fluctuations to propagate along the loop, essentially the loop length divided by that alphane speed that, that I defined earlier. The tau photosphere is also another time scale that you can con construct out of the typical length and the typical velocity of the photospheric motions that we've been talking about. Um, and these n and m's are sort of a, a a, a different thing for each proposed physical process. And later I'll also show a plot of N versus M space and where the different theories live in that space, which is kind of cool. Um, so yeah, it is possible to take these and fold them all in and produce a nice, uh, uh, maybe it's not nice, but there, there's a lot of terms in there, but basically expressing the coronal heating function in terms of these basic ingredients and the scaling exponents uh, that are still undetermined, but we'll we'll talk about as we as we go forward. Yeah, so actually, I wanted to stop at this point and give you a chance to to think a little bit. Maybe this is sort of a think pair share type thing. If you want to talk to each other um, in the chat or something, um, but yeah, if you know, th there are certain factors here that I think are pretty clear that say the, 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 the photospheric shaking velocity or the magnetic field. If you made, the, made either of those things stronger, I think in just about every conception of coronal heating, you would expect the heating rate to get bigger, right? If you're shaking something stronger, you're adding more energy. If you have a stronger magnetic field, then you've got more, more magnetic energy and maybe you can tap more of that energy via whatever process. But let me just ask you can, you, can you take what's given here and come up with sort of a finite range of, of viable values for this M exponent from that? There was a quick answer in the chat. Feel free to look at that and, and make sure that it, uh, that it makes sense. <laughs> 
All right. Yeah. Maybe if I do these in the future, I should create like breakout rooms and have you talk to each other in the rooms. There's there's all sorts of things, ways we can do this. But uh, yeah, plus one on minus one to plus two. Yes. Thank you. But yeah, that's it, right? If the if the exponent on this has to be positive, m has to be greater than minus one. If the exponent on this has to be positive, it has to be less than plus two. But yeah, that kind of reduces our 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 possibility space. And what we'll see is most, nearly all of the, the, the proposed theories do actually fall in this, in this range, but it's good to try to reduce it from infinity all the way down to something finite. Uh, there are some complications, of course, you know, if, if the photospheric velocity and the magnetic field depend on one another in some weird nonlinear way, then that might complicate our thinking a little bit. And well, take a look at the umbra of a sunspot. This is a very nice observation from Sanjeev Tiwari. Um, in the darkest part of the central sunspot, that's where the field is the strongest. And that's also where the velocity of, of the photospheric motions, the up and down redshift and blue shift velocities that are typically of order a few kilometers per second in these outer regions, right? This is the granulation. The upflows in the granule centers are blue. The downflows in the lanes are red, but in that center, oops, in the center part of the sunspot umbra, it goes away because the magnetic field here is strong enough to suppress the convection underneath the surface of the sun, and there's nothing to see really. It's it's much uh, suppressed, so it's sort of a nonlinear behavior that might mess up this scaling. But I just wanted to point out the basic idea, and then maybe there's some exceptions that prove the rule like that. But yeah, um, I guess, yeah, that was my sort of summary of how to sort of quantitatively lay out what the coronal heating rate must be, and then we can sort of fill in the details with the, uh, with the theoretical models. And now we can start to talk about the different ideas that people have. Um, the sort of one idea is, something that would apply if these two time scales were sort of ordered in a certain way, right? If the photospheric driving time scale, shaking back and forth of the field, was very short compared to the time it takes for energy to propagate all along the, the loop, then what you get is essentially a wave dominated system, right? This is the system that you get, I said earlier, when you take the magnetic field and you pluck it and then you watch those perturbations uh, propagate along the magnetic field. Um, yeah, in the form of waves or wave packets or shocks or whatever. And that provides the way that the energy gets up into the corona. And then the heating happens when those waves damp out their energy, right? It's only in a very idealized system that waves just go on forever without changing their properties. In a real plasma where there's particle collisions, that give you effects like viscosity or resistivity or, or heat conductivity, um, those effects can take a wave and gradually erode it away um, and damp it out. So the energy goes from the magnetic field into random, you know, uh, randomized particle motions, which we call heating. So yeah, some people have called this an AC model, alternating current, because of the, 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 the fastness of the foot point motions that, that produce the waves. Well, of course, if you've got an AC, you've got to have a DC, and that is happening in the opposite extreme, right? If the foot point driving motions are very slow, and the time it takes energy to flow along the field is very fast, then we're sort of in the opposite case. The, in, that, in that case, the magnetic field has plenty of time to readjust to any of these slow changes that are being imposed from, from either end of the loop. This cartoon I'm showing from Gene Parker is actually sort of, sort of like what's shown up here, but if you take a pair of scissors and you cut down the middle and you take those two ends and you, you just arrange them vertically just in order to be able to see what happens to the magnetic field better in this slow driving case, what happens is that the field gets slowly tangled up and braided because there's plenty of time for it to come to a new equilibrium after each little perturbation at either end. And the interior part of that field has to, has to live with all, those, all, all the previous history of all those changes. So the magnetic field lines get tangled up like that. And of course, the field gets more and more complicated over time. 
And if you look at individual spots in those tangled fields, occasionally you will see places where the magnetic field lines are sort of oppositely directed, maybe not 180 degrees oppositely, but maybe partially oppositely directed. And if those oppositely directed components get pushed together, you'll get magnetic reconnection. Um, question about do the foot points actually move across the surface or is it just the magnetic field changing? Um, I think it is more the latter it, because the, 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 the upper and the, the actual horizontal boundary conditions are continuous uh, along those, those square plates. So really it's just a matter of you know, how do we draw these fields? You know, they're not really these discrete lines that we're talking about. You can draw, draw field lines from, from any point uh, on the on the surface all the way through the system uh so yeah it's really a continuous thing but the but the 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 individual field lines as we draw them do make it a lot easier to sort of visualize how complex is the field and how how much you know are there are there spots are there topological places in the middle where where the field where opposite directions get pushed together and of course magnetic reconnection leads to energy release the and that's another way of transferring energy from the magnetic field to the particles. And it happens in a very sort of impulsive, bursty way. They're called nanoflares because they're often something like 10 to the minus nine of the energy of a typical solar flare. But if they're happening all over the place, they might be heating up the, uh, the corona sort of continuously. Yeah. Yes, very good. Um, yeah, so these are sort of two extremes of types of processes that can heat the corona. Unfortunately, many parts of the corona don't obey those much greater than or much less than signs. In many parts of the corona, those two time scales are sort of of the same order of magnitude of each other. So we're sort of in the murky middle between the AC and the DC regimes. And when things are in those murky middles, you can sort of have things happening that take on the character of, of both of those, right? You can have fluctuations that propagate along, but also act like nano flares, right? So I can give sort of a laundry list and we'll, we'll talk more about some of these as we go forward. You can have waves that turn into shocks. You can have wave packets that crash into each other, right? If they're going in both directions along the loop, you can have perturbations that, that interact with one another. And as they pass through each other, they end up making each other more complicated. That was what was trying to be conveyed in this cartoon uh, here. And by making each other more complicated, that creates structure at smaller scales. And that's called a turbulent cascade. All sorts of other things that can happen. Yeah, in general, if you get smaller scales that are sort of randomly spontaneously forming and creating even still smaller and still smaller and still smaller things as they go, that also makes it easier to, to heat the plasma because tiny things are much easier to convert between magnetic and particle energy than, than big things that stretch across the whole corona. Um, yeah, hopefully we'll quantify that as we go along too. But yeah, there can be intermittent and nano flareish type bursty heating in this intermediate regime too. Yeah, I've got the, the purple here to talk about waves and the, and the green to talk about the nano flares because it really sort of takes on the character of, of both. Yeah, it can be complicated. So yeah, I've tried to make a little graphical summary of the AC limit, the DC limit. Are there waves that are propagating up in different types or are the fields uh, becoming much more braided and complex and ultimately releasing their energy in the form of little magnetic reconnection events popping off all the way through? Or is it both, something in between? There are also some other scenarios um, involved too, right? Both of these AC and DC pictures involve the second of the two terms in the pointing flux, right? Shaking things back and forth and watching how the how everything propagates up into the corona. There's also that flux emergence idea. When new stuff emerges up into the corona, the new magnetic field has to interact with the magnetic field that's already there. And maybe you can, maybe something pushes up, pushes two oppositely directed fields together, whoops, and creates uh, more magnetic reconnection. This is sometimes called interchange reconnection because you can have something, some of the plasma that started off on this closed loop, eventually going into an open field, 
going up higher into the corona, some of the stuff on an open field being closed back down, and subducting back down after this uh, bursty reconnection event happens. We observe things called coronal jets that we think are exactly this happening, popping off all over the, the, the surface of the sun. Does that solve the entire coronal heating problem? Probably not, because if it did, then we would not really see isolated jets. We would just see a jet-filled thing everywhere, which I don't think we see. Um, there's also another type of coronal heating that doesn't involve uh, the foot point motions at all. Basically, if you have a piece of the magnetic field that's highly twisted, that's a lot of magnetic energy stored up in that, uh, in that twisted magnetic field. And even if you stopped the, dry, the, 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 the foot point driving of motions from the bottom, that will still, th this, this thing on the lower right will still um, be able to produce heating over some finite amount of time as it relaxes down and loses, um, basically undergoes MHD instabilities that, uh, that uh, relaxes the energy relaxes the magnetic energy while increasing the particle energy. So there's a whole class of models of coronal heating called Taylor relaxation, where that's where the energy comes from, right? If there's no twist, then there's really no, uh, no, no energy coming into the system. Yeah, maybe this is only important in the very twisted types of active region magnetic fields. But yeah, we got to try to cover them all. And I think the next thing, yeah, here's that table from that review paper that I talked about. The only thing I want to point out is that sort of the, there's these four classes of the models, right? There's the wave AC models, there's the DC models, which are the third thing. In between the things where they, the two time scales are sort of the same, I'm calling those turbulence models. Notice cascade is showing up a lot in the, uh, in the description. And then there are these Taylor relaxation models where they depend on the, the twist being there. Um, these lambdas and capital thetas represent these dimensionless ratios of length and time scales. And look at all the powers. There's all these different powers in all these different uh, uh, models. And those are the Ns and the Ms. And maybe a better way to visualize those would be in this MN diagram. And yeah, the, the, the four different, differently colored regions are those four regions from the, from the table. Uh, you can sort of see that there's a rough ordering where the where the waves are sort of to the right, the uh, the, uh, the the DC models and the ones depending on twisting and braiding are all to the left. Um, the black square comes about when you look at in the past 15 to 20 years, there have been many MHD three-dimensional numerical simulations of the corona. They may not contain all of the physics yet. Um, but they still do a decent job of producing coronal heating. So you can take those models and you can uh, data mine those, those cubes, those, those you know, MHD cubes, and figure out what the heating rates had to be to produce those. And you can back out what the exponents are, and guess what? They fall into this, this box here. And if you ever wanted one picture that tells you why the coronal heating problem is so hard to solve and why we haven't done it yet, I think this picture is the one that does it because there's this murky middle region here around one and one where all the different <laughs> all the different models and the simulations sort of all come together. If if you really want to tell which of these models is right and which of these models is wrong, it would have been great if the these regions were completely separated <laughs> by by large amounts from one another. But the fact that they all sort of cross over in this middle region here means that we still don't quite know how to distinguish between them. And yeah, we're, we're getting there. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is one interesting way of, of visualizing this. All right. All right. So now I think I've gone from 1C to 2A. I've, I've gone from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the description of the coronal heating to this more practical uh, uh, aspect of if we know how the heating happens, how does it affect the plasma density, temperature, pressure. And I'd like to compute those. And again, basically what we want to do is figure out why does this, why does the steady state corona look like these, these typical uh, spatial dependencies of temperature and density, like I showed last time. All right. Okay. So yeah, here we are back to the equation of thermal energy conservation. And I've written it now in a way where it's basically you know, if you have a parcel of the corona and you want to know how its thermal energy density is changing in time, 
On the right hand side, there are a whole bunch of heating and cooling terms that all have to be taken into account. And so I've got the four of those terms on the right. Oh, I guess, yeah, the, the, the thermal energy density, you can sort of write in terms of the pressure. Uh, and there's these other terms. There's this advective term. Basically, if, if once we start to look at the solar wind and there's a consistent flow velocity along the magnetic field, the, uh, that can take energy away from the parcel or add energy into the parcel, depending on how the, uh, how the dependence of the, uh, of, this, of the flow goes. So you can have these things called adiabatic cooling as, as if a parcel leaves the sun and starts to grow, it's expanding and it would eventually want to cool off uh, if it stays uh, adiabatic. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna ignore this term for coronal loops because we'll assume that they're all static. That there's no flow along the loop. There's radiation, and that, that means that there's a coupling between the radiation field and the, the particles, right? If the, if the atoms are making a lot of photons, then that means that those photons are leaving the system and it's losing energy. The, 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 the atoms that were making those photons have, have lost energy. So a gain in photon energy means a loss in, in particle energy. There's different ways to write this in different parts of the solar atmosphere. There's heat conduction, right? If you have something hot over here, cold over here, heat is going to wanna to conduct from the hot region to the cold region. And this turns it into a second order differential equation because we've got two derivatives along the spatial direction. We'll talk about this more. Some of these terms can be written in terms of divergences of fluxes, but not all of them. So I think it often makes sense to me just to think of them as a sum of heating and cooling terms. And if we want to solve for a time steady situation, then this left hand side is zero. So really what we just want to solve for is the sum of the heating and cooling terms has to be zero. Heating must balance cooling, right? Some of them are positive, some of them are negative. All righty. And now as we go along, there are different parts of the solar atmosphere where different terms are, uh, are all not equally important, right? Some of them are totally negligible in some regions. Some of them are key. So I've made a little chart here to show where are the terms important, right? The, the, the radiation terms are important close to the sun. The heating terms are sort of important in the middle. Heat conduction is only important once you get up into the hot corona because uh, charged particles uh, conduct heat proportional to the temperature to the five halves power we'll find. So the hottest parts conduct the most. Um, and then there's this advection term. I, I put question marks in there because we'll, we'll get back to that when we talk about the, uh, the solar wind. Yeah, we're getting to the end. I just wanted to maybe say a little bit about just this first, this first application of the photosphere. We're, we're not gonna do too much with the photosphere in this course, but I just wanted to talk about it because it is kind of a simple thing. That's just basically Q red equals zero. Everything else is unimportant in the photosphere. Um, this Q red term could be positive or negative, depending, as I said, uh, on what the, what the atoms are doing in concert with the photons. If they're making a lot of photons, then the particles are losing energy. If they're absorbing a lot of photons, then the particles are gaining energy. And we could go through and write an energy conservation equation for the photons, right? We can take the uh, radiative transfer equation, which if you haven't seen before is, 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 is kind of meaningless here, but I can, I can fill you in uh, later on about what it means basically integrate it over all solid angles of all the different possible directions the photons could be flowing in. And we can get an energy conservation equation for the photons that looks a lot like these other energy conservation equations. Photon energy density, changing in time, divergence of a flux, and then something on the right-hand side that represents gains or losses, right? If this thing on the right-hand side is positive, that means photons are being produced. There's a net emission of photons. But that also has to mean that the particles are losing energy because total energy has to be conserved. If, it's, if this thing is negative, photons are being absorbed or destroyed, and that means the particles have to be gaining thermal energy. So if we want to write the heating or cooling rate for the particles, that's got to be the minus of this thing on the right-hand side. So rather than the source function minus the mean radiation field, which again, if you don't know what those are, don't worry about it. It's the opposite, it's J minus S.
We also have to integrate over the entire spectrum because photons of all different frequencies, all different flavors can contribute to heating or cooling the, the particles. And yeah, it's basically something proportional to the opacity of the gas times this difference that tells us whether it's a net emission or a net absorption. Ah, it's a lot going on. Um, in terms of, of the solar atmosphere, one way to sort of boil this type of equation down is that you can notice that the source function is in, in thermal equilibrium anyway, it's basically just proportional to temperature to the fourth. Whoops, ah. It's this thing minus T to the fourth here on the right. This other term, you can think of it as another temperature to the fourth thing, but it's essentially the, the, the radiation temperature that the system wants to evolve to, right? When, when eventually this thing reaches a time steady equilibrium and there's no more net absorption of photons or net emission of photons, everything's in balance, then this term is equal to zero. And that means that the local temperature of the particles is equal to this so-called radiative equilibrium temperature. And that's what I was sort of plotting in this, in this temperature plot before with this, blue, uh, with this blue dotted curve. This is the temperature that the solar atmosphere would reduce to if there was nothing else going on other than the temperature wanting to reduce to its own local radiative equilibrium. And I, I do wanna, the last thing I'll say is that this is a stable equilibrium because if you make it a little bit hotter than the equilibrium, this thing turns negative because the temperature is higher. That means that it cools back down. If you make it a little cooler, this thing turns positive and it heats back up. And this thing makes for a very rapid approach to a, to a stable equilibrium, like in this, in this cartoon here. Was that as far? Yes, the next thing is the chromosphere. And I think the next thing I wanna do is just skip to the very end and talk just for a second about what we wanna do for next week. Um, yeah, I said here, if we didn't make it all the way through these slides, please go through them. I'll post them soon and you can just read them all. We'll, we'll go through the rest of them a little bit uh, at the beginning of the next class. We'll also start engaging with an actual model that allows you to, to figure out what is the temperature and the density and the pressure for a given amount of coronal heating. The paper that will help you get there is this Pete Martin's 2010 paper. I've got a link here, and uh, I think I've, I've posted it on Google Drive and emailed uh, a good number of you. Again, some recommendations if you don't have time to read the whole thing. We feel free to talk about it on the Slack. I'll create a new channel for paper two discussion. And yeah, also next week, hopefully we'll also be able to start to, I'll start going through and I'll share the screen on my uh, Jupyter notebook and then I'll distribute it to you so you can uh, extend it and do some other things with it. I'll talk more about that next week. Ugh, sorry to go a little bit over. Any, any questions? There's a lot of material in there that, that I wanted to get through, but hopefully you'll have time to, to think about it in a little bit more detail too. Oh, Amanda, raised hand, yes. Um, I have a kind of basic, probably jargon question. So in the, in the reading, I also posted this on Slack, so happy to discuss it there. But in the reading, I was kind of surprised to see active regions and quiet sun and terms like that being applied to the corona, because I had always kind of associated them with the photosphere, and if it's just a bunch of granules, you have quiet sun. Um, so do those regions like extend up? Like if I were to take a tube around an active region and somehow slice it all the way down to the core would like the whole um, section of the sun be considered that region or do they yeah. jump around or? I mean, I, I don't think it's a, it's a perfect uh, correspondence, right? I mean, uh, observers, come up with these terms for the types of, you know, diagnostics they look at, you know, I think, you know, just the fact that active regions and sunspots are essentially the same thing. There was probably a decade or two of confusion in there uh, in the early part of the 20th century when, when those things were, were figured out. Um, I think active region, quiet sun and, uh, and, uh, and, and coronal hole were originally, uh, uh, coming from coronal diagnostics. Um, 
if you look at the magnetic field that you can measure in the photosphere, there are patterns that you can you can probably figure out which one of those you're you're in um, based on the strength and also the the average polarity of the magnetic field. Right, if it's a weak field and you don't know whether you're in a quiet sun or a coronal hole, the coronal hole is going to be much more unipolar. The quiet sun is going to be much more salt and pepper balanced uh, plus and minus fields, um, and those those do correspond pretty well to the things that you can observe up in the chromosphere and the corona. Um, but I don't know if it's perfect. I don't know if you could draw perfect lines around it uh, just by using, say, photospheric magnetic field diagnostics um, or not. But yeah, it's, it's pretty close. All right, thank you. All right, I've held you on longer than I should have. So I will stop the recording.